Dropbox needs uh, no introduction. You're sort of the epitome of the consumerization of the enterprise. You started uh, as a consumer company. You moved into the enterprise. A lot of momentum. Uh, give us an update of where that momentum is today. Sure. So uh, first of all, I, I assume at least some people are familiar with Dropbox. How many folks here use Dropbox at home or at work? So that's probably 80% of the audience. I was going to do that. but Well, ahead. there you go. <laughs> uh, so to give you a little bit of an update, Dropbox, we, have, uh, we just crossed half a billion registered users. So we have uh, essentially three products. Our basic product, which is a, a two gigabytes of storage um, a product, which many of you may have been introduced to. Uh, we are adding about 10 million users every month for that product. Most people who come to Dropbox actually are referred by a friend. Uh, so someone sends you a link or invites you to a shared folder, and that's how you become familiar with the product. Uh, really pioneered the space starting in, in 2008 uh, out of Drew Halston's imagination. Uh, he was on a bus ride and uh, forgot his USB stick. He thought, you know what? For four hours, I'm going to waste my time because I can't get access to my uh, files. There's got to be a better way. So he started writing the code that is Dropbox. And uh, that really led us into, into the business. So more and more people were using Dropbox at work. Uh, the company created a product called Pro. For $100 a year, you get a terabyte of, of storage space. And Pro actually is a work use product. So 70% of our Pro subscribers, and there are millions of Pro subscribers, use Dropbox in a, in a work setting. Um, and then about two and a half years ago, we invented or, or uh, launched a product called Dropbox Business. Dropbox Business gives IT administrators the control that they need and the security that they need to operate in a large scale environment uh, while preserving the usability that really has made Dropbox great. Um, so we have 150,000 uh, paying teams on Dropbox Business today. Uh, last fall, we announced a, a new uh, product called Dropbox Enterprise. And uh, that enables large-scale companies like Expedia, Under Armour, uh, to deploy in their existing IT environment. So we have a set of APIs that integrate with all of the security uh, and controls that you already have in your environment. So that's an overview of, of what we do and where we've, where we've come. OK, so um, part of your transformation is, is going from the, the, the consumer side to the enterprise. You did the show of hands. Almost everybody uses um, Dropbox in some form. Can I get a show of hand of how many are Dropbox for business or enterprise customers? A smaller set, I smaller guess. Set. That's opportunity. It's a lot of opportunity <laughs> for you. So, so um, what you're attempting to do, which is going from consumer to enterprise, is, is very rare, maybe unprecedented for a company. Um, how is that transformation going? Well, you know, if you look at some of the more interesting tech companies of the last 20 years, a lot of them actually had huge consumer pull. So for those who are, are my age or older, you might remember lining up uh, at, at your Best Buy for Windows 95. Right? It, it really was a consumer phenomenon. Uh, if you think about the, how many people are using iPhones today here, and, and all of you are using them, I suspect, in a work setting, iPhone clearly was a consumer product launched with AT&T. There really wasn't a business intent initially. It was all about, let's create a great experience for the end user. And our belief is that's the way a lot of business technology is going to go. Not all of it, but certainly where you're trying to empower your employees to work more productively, they, uh, they are in a fundamentally different environment than they were five years ago. They all have access to a million applications in their pocket. And if they can find an application that saves them some time or something that they're used to, they're just going to try it. And, and some of those applications will make, them make their way into the workplace. So we think, although it might be hard, we think it's, it's a skill that a lot of enterprise uh, technology companies are going to need to learn. OK, so let's drill down into that transformation. It, it, it sort of happened when you joined about two, three years ago. Um, what changes have you had to do organizationally, on the product side, on your sales? Yeah, so I, I, about two years ago, I, I would say that uh, the company followed its customers. So in the earlier days, people were asking for simple things like uh, shared billing uh, of multiple pro accounts. But over time, we, we, we continued to listen to businesses. We had larger and larger companies coming to us. 
And, uh, and we really had to transform the, the, the company itself. So in terms of who we hire, how we organize, uh, we, have, we have people from Microsoft, VMware, uh, Cisco, Oracle, really across the enterprise uh, gamut of, of companies. And making sure we had that influx of, of uh, a talent was important. Uh, making sure we preserved that focus on usability. And uh, Dropbox has a very high percentage of designers. So if you're coming from the consumer space and you think about a mobile phone, you have a really small amount of space in which to help someone get something done. And, and if you think about c consumer applications like Facebook or Instagram, they're super simple, but there's actually a lot of effort that goes into the design of those applications so that they can do fairly complex tasks on a really small screen, and it's seamless and it's easy for the user. That requires real design skill, uh, which is hard to find, and, and we pride ourselves on the designers. Uh, but they had to learn a new language and be able to, to, to work in a, in a different environment where the business needs are as important as the end user needs. And that balance is, is hard to strike, and we, we, we have lots of debates uh, all the time on that. Um, when you're dealing with enterprise customers, there's a, there's a profoundly different relationship with the customer uh, than with a consumer product. What are you doing to respond to the needs of those customers? So uh, first of all, the, the, the number one thing that we have to do and we've been able to do over the last year or so is to prove that Dropbox is secure and gives IT administrators the controls that they need to operate in their environment. So there are some table stakes investments we made over the last two years. Uh, HIPAA compliance, we have our SOC 1, 2, and 3 audits. Um, ISO, what, 27001 and 27018 uh, compliance. So these are just certifications that assure typically chief security officers that the architecture that we have is secure uh, and that our approach to security is, is fundamentally and technically sound. Uh, but then there's a number of partnerships that we thought were really important to strike with best of breed security uh, companies. So HP Enterprises is one of them. Um, but companies like Splunk, uh, companies like single sign on Okta, uh, Active Directory, um, uh, Symantec, a number of, of companies that are already in our customers' environments, it was important for us to integrate with them seamlessly. So we have about 2,000 partners that are in the security arena that have integrated with Dropbox so that if you bring Dropbox into a large enterprise, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Despite the changes you've made and the progress you've made uh, with customers, there are skeptics out there that say, how can you be both enterprise and consumer? Let's take something like product. You know, you, you have, everybody has limited resources. You've got to invest in the product roadmap. Your consumer guys are telling you we should go this way. Your enterprise guys are telling you something different. How do you balance those, and, and who wins out? Well, we're pretty focused on teams. So it could be, a, it, it could be a, a small team in a large company. So half of the Fortune uh, 1,000 currently have a, a Dropbox deployment. Some of them, it's the entire company. In others, it's, it's 10 people. Um, so we focus on teams, and if you think about it, the way a team works, whether it's a small team or a large team, is fairly, fairly consistent. There's lots of consistencies there. So if we focus on how the team works, that's sort of the organizing principle for product development. I think when it comes to very large enterprises, you know, the kinds of things that are important are, are that we have a field sales team that listens to customers and brings that feedback back to our developers, that we're exposing our developers directly to the CIOs on a, on a regular basis. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of that development and, and those efforts have happened over the last year. But look, I think, I think there's always going to be skeptics. The, the reality of where our business is, we believe that consumers are going to shape the footprint of IT in a massive way over the next 10 years, and it's really just starting. So the half a billion people who use Dropbox are our best salespeople. And typically, when we go into a company, an example would be Expedia. Um, Expedia has 10,000 employees. They had provisioned OneDrive for the entire company, but nobody was using it. Uh, in fact, they have 4,000 people that were registered. OneDrive being Microsoft. OneDrive being Microsoft's product, which is free, because they already had an enterprise-wide enterprise uh, license with Microsoft. Um, 4,000 people of the 10,000 were registered from their Expedia domain uh, for Dropbox and were using it at work. And we could look at the file types. They weren't using it 
for a home use case. They were sharing PowerPoints and presentations and marketing materials. They were also sharing outside of Expedia, which is also a very powerful use case for Dropbox where it's just easy to do. And so, and so in, in that case, uh, once, we, once we had the discussion about security, it was fairly straightforward. The, I, the, the CIO wanted to empower the employees of Expedia to work better, more effectively, uh, while giving them the security they need. And so that's the kind of dialogue that we have and the kind of uh, momentum that that creates. Okay. So without getting too much into the details of your product roadmap, what, what else do you think you need to do now to convince the people in this room that they should have enterprise deployments of Dropbox? So what, a big area where we're, that we're focused on now, let's say two different, two different vectors. Um, one is most companies have a, a large, old infrastructure of uh, file servers, SharePoint, VPN that's costly, that takes a lot of your team's time to maintain, that isn't particularly mobile enabled, and that, at least when we talk to CIOs, they actually would like to get rid of it. So the question for us is, how can Dropbox perform that task? How can we take all of a company's knowledge uh, and put it on Dropbox, make it accessible to the entire company, to people outside when that's appropriate, outside the company, while giving the IT department what it needs to ensure control and security. Uh, that's a big task, and there's a lot of product innovation that we have planned over the course of the next year to make that really a reality. So our, our biggest competitor is not someone else in our space. It's really you know, NetApp and, and SharePoint and this, this, the legacy uh, systems. Only eight percent of the public, eight uh, percent of the storage in the world is is in a cloud today. So most most information is still stored locally in, in some way, shape, or form. And when you have a a, a very uh, mixed use environment where you have employees or partners on iOS and Android and Windows, um, it doesn't make sense for for that architecture to exist. So we think that's a big long term opportunity for us that will require us to innovate in the core Dropbox product. And then the second vector is really around uh, enabling people to get work done more effectively. So Dropbox is most useful for a company like Under Armour when everybody in the company is using it and everybody outside the company, their partners, are all, uh, their um, suppliers, are also using Dropbox to submit samples and to manage workflow. Uh, what we find, though, is that people want to communicate more. Uh, using Dropbox. So they want not just to be able to work on the marketing brochure for the latest Under Armour campaign with their ad agency uh, and their media outlets, but they also want to be able to communicate to one another while they're doing that. And so we're launching products that are much more in the direction of communication and collaboration. The first of which was a product called Paper, which uh, is in alpha. We have tens of thousands of customers using it now. Uh, but it allows you to collaborate around any kind of a document, any kind of a file, very, really designed first for mobile uh, in a way that you can't, you, you can't today, either in Dropbox or, or in any other application. So, so that's the direction that we're heading. Okay. Let me switch gears a little bit and drill into the Dropbox business itself. Um, some people say you're building a company around storage, which is uh, something that's quickly becoming commoditized and whose price is going to zero. How do you build a business around that? So the, the great thing about the, the price of storage falling is our, our largest cost of goods is actually the cost of storage. And that's declining 25 to 30% year over year, which is phenomenal for us. Now, we don't, we don't get paid because we're just storage. If you think about it, it's, it, it's easy, or not easy, but it's cheap to go to Amazon and just create a, a storage instance and up you go. The problem is it's, not, it's hard to access, uh, it's not mobile enabled, there's no preview functions, there's no search functions, the security controls are not quite the same. There's a lot of drawbacks to just using what is truly commodity storage. So we get paid because of the user layer and because of the, the user experience, the fact that we work on every platform uh, including Linux, uh, the fact that we essentially replace the filer uh, on, on or, your, or your, we become your uh, home drive in, on your desktop, which again is a great user experience. So 
the commoditization of the actual storage, it's no different than the fact that most of the parts in an iPhone are commoditized, yet the iPhone itself earns a pretty good premium. Your competitors in this market are Google, Microsoft, um, Box, which is smaller but has sort of a, a perhaps stronger foothold in the enterprise. How do you stay ahead? So we, we've, our, our company is founded by two, uh, well, one MIT grad and one MIT dropout. I, I think it, to be a good startup, one of them has to drop out. Uh, the, the, uh, the company's technical, and we've made a conscious decision to invest in the product. So if you look at our in, uh, investment profile or our headcount, half of our headcount is technical. And our belief is, you know, I came from Google where we were, we, we followed that rule to the T. We're going to invest in the product. We're going to invest in R&D. We'll get to sales. We'll get to marketing. That's important, but it's really important to have a great product. Uh, so that's our approach, which is distinctly different than some of our competitors. We're also focused just on this, this space, and, and we, we invented this space, where some of those, the larger companies are not. And we don't really have an interest in keeping you in any one ecosystem or, or any one platform. So once you put all your information in, into one of the, uh, what we're finding and what CIOs are telling us is they are, they're hesitant to put all of their information, all their company's information, with a Microsoft or with a Google, because it's a, it's a form of lock-in, and everybody understands that. So I think there's some fundamental differences. Uh, we, we see this space as critically important. We think the way work is changing is, 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 is quite uh, stunning, and we see that change playing out over the next couple of years, which gives us an opportunity to expand from the base that we've built so far. So you're, you're Switzerland. You're the neutral, neutral player. Well, we, we certainly do. We certainly will work with any any ecosystem. We have no no uh, ability to lock you into a larger platform. That's that's not our business. Okay. So last week you came out very strongly um, in support of Apple on its battle with encryption with the government, the FBI. Um, you don't make smartphones. Somebody could argue this is not your fight. Um, why did you make it your fight, and um, why is it important? to the people here? I think it's very important. So we filed an amicus brief uh, on behalf of Apple in the case. Um, and I think there are a couple things that are really interesting about the case. One is that when the FBI seized the phone, uh, the first thing they did was they, ch they changed the password of the associated iCloud account. And what that did was that locked the phone out from syncing back to the iCloud account. Had they not done that, they could have just uh, submitted a lawful order to Apple, and Apple would have been compelled to disclose the contents of that unencrypted iCloud account. Uh, unfortunately, when they changed the password to the iCloud account, it, 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 it stopped the phone from syncing back up with the service, and there's nothing they could do. So then the government had no, they looked around for a law that would compel Apple to decrypt the phone. And the reality is there is no law. So they went all the way back to the All Writs Act of 1789, right, which was at least 100 years before the telegraph, as power to compel the, the, the Apple to write code to unencrypt the phone. And in, in fact, Congress had debated forcing companies to, uh, or, or creating a law that would force companies to create a backdoor, and they decided not to do that. So our view is, look, that, that there is no law that compels Apple to do what you, they're asking it to do. And if there were to be a law, that requires public debate. And that requires public discourse. That's what democracy is all about. We don't believe that relying on this old law is, the, is, is proper. Uh, and that was the basis for our brief. So, so that's, that's the basis for the brief. But why, why was there so much passion, so much unity? I don't, I don't think there's been that kind of unity in tech since the SOPA PIPA argument a few years ago? Well, I, I, think, I think most, most people in, in the Valley and in tech believe encryption is fundamental to, to privacy. And, and without encryption, if, if companies are compelled to write back doors to encryption, basically everything's exposed. Uh, it creates tons of problems for consumers, business problems. It creates tons of of ethical problems, 
And we believe if, if we're going to go down that route, it, it needs to be a lot more thoughtful than a judge issuing an order to Apple uh, and, and then Apple being forced to write code. So, so it's possible that, that the path that the government goes down over a longer period of time is to, to force that kind of act, activity, but we don't believe that it's proper or will result in a, a kind of a good outcome for anybody if it's just forced by a judge. Okay. I want to take uh, one or two questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and, and get a microphone. Let me ask you one more. Um, so these issues of, of information security and access to, to your customers' information are different uh, in different jurisdictions in different countries. Yep. You're aspiring to be a global enterprise. A lot of your customers are global. How do you handle these issues when you're talking about Brazil or China or whatever country? Yeah, so, so one thing that we are big believers in is, is transparency. And whenever we receive an inquiry from any government, we, uh, we publish the fact that we received the inquiry, which is what we can legally do. Um, so if we in some cases, uh, the inquiries come from US courts. They uh, are, are executing a search warrant. In other cases, they're coming from overseas institutions. So our belief is the more we can disclose about inquiries, uh, the more thoughtful governments will be in asking services like us to respond. But of course, we respond in every case that we have a lawful request. Um, but it is really complicated. It's complicated in particular in Europe uh, with the failure of Safe Harbor, which many of you are familiar with. Uh, and it's not clear what's going to replace Safe Harbor right now. Um, we're dealing with that. Uh, the, the federation of the internet is happening in, in many ways. It, just to give you a little bit of, of background, many companies in Europe are saying, you know, we don't really know what's going on with regulation, but we would feel much more comfortable if you put your data in Europe, which, which in theory makes a lot of sense. But if you think about how the data is really flowing across the internet. Uh, you can have a file that's, that's resident in Germany accessed from someone in the US. Next thing you know, it's replicated in the US. Next thing you know, it's in Brazil. It's really not particularly practical to say all information must stay, stay in Europe or stay in Germany. So we're working through that. And, um, and it's, it's actually quite fascinating. Question over here. That was actually my question about how you're dealing with data transfers, but it, it's, so there, there is this proliferation of, of transfer requirements and then things like the Russian localization law, which requires data to be preserved there. So if you're, a, if you're talking to an enterprise that, that works in 100 countries, is there today a solution for this problem, for, if we're using Dropbox and, and navigating the shoal, you know, the, the, all of these different data laws that are conflicting in some cases? Yeah, so the, the biggest one that we run into is the, is, is the European concern, and, and, uh, and it's not all companies. We, most of our customers really don't seem to, they don't seem to care, they don't ask. Um, the larger companies, particularly those that are subject to some regulation of some sort, that's the first question that we get. Um, we, are, we are going to be domiciling data in Germany for those who want to have their data stored in Germany beginning in the third quarter, so in, in, in three or four months. Um, but that doesn't solve the problem because you will have Australia asking for the same thing and Brazil asking for the same thing. So there really needs to be a regulatory solution at some point because it's just not possible, practical, for every company to have all of their data domiciled in 100 different countries. It's not going to work. Uh, uh, so in the meantime, I think CIOs of large multi multinationals have a hard, it's, it's very difficult. There isn't clear legal guidance. Uh, and you have to pick a policy that is principled and makes sense for the situation that you're in. But it's, it's absolutely uncertain. Um, I can't tell. Are we out of time? The clock changed. I gave more time. Mm -hmm. You gave me more time, so more questions. Um, so, so one of the things uh, you discussed at the beginning was just sort of obviously the premise of moving from consumer to enterprise. You talked about the iPhone in, in use in both cases. As an enterprise CIO, particularly relative to privacy and data risk and a bunch of other issues we're, we're becoming unfortunate experts on lately, um, how do I deal with the fact that people are using your product for personal use and for enterprise use? 
and the sort of real risk, I think, of commingling of data and you know, kind of how do I navigate that confusion and make sure I don't end up with kind of you know, personal data in the wrong place and enterprise data in the wrong place? So when we provision a new large enterprise, the, we, the first thing we do is we uh, offer every employee the opportunity to link their personal account to a new work account and, and we help the organization uh, move information that might be in the personal account into a work account. Most people don't know that by using a personal account, they're necessarily violating the rules of the company. But we explain that with the help of the CIO's office. We have tools that allow people to migrate their data uh, quite easily. And then they have a clear work account and a clear personal account uh, that are linked to their identity. So once you're in that state, then the problem that you're describing goes away. All right, we're flat out of time. Dennis, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks.